Do you have a link to the chat? Would you like it? Yeah. Where would I have been able to find it? When I gave you the link to the episode, mm -hmm. there is a, uh, whoops, okay. Then the chat's over on the right-hand side. Okay, yeah. so opening YouTube. So Gosh. I need to figure out how to pop that out. So there's a little button. If you right-click the little dot, dot dot at the very bottom corner, it lets you pop it out, but I can give you the link if you want. But we can right. you know how to do it on your own. Okay, right-clicking it was not the correct not, answer. No, it's like a little Le dot dot dot. It's the okay, it's a normal click. The I have a left click. hand I have a left-handed setup and that just yeah. sometimes leads to chaos. And then you see the and then it pops up yep. a little chat and then you can close now the original on YouTube. Yeah. Yep. And I've made a bunch of our good friends moderators. Yay. Mm -hmm. A few people that I haven't made moderators, but I'm gonna do that now. Like you. And then there's okay, so well, check this out. So okay. go down to the very bottom, the bottom right. Mm-hmm. You click the, and you can see view active users, like on the little dot, dot, dot again, right? Hold on. It's thinking about doing something. It's giving me a white square with nothing in it. And then I can say, hello to Bevo LJ, David Joseph Wesley, Elad Avron, Guido Bibra, James Haney, Jim Meeker, Nancy Graziano, Richard Strassel, Silver Westby, Stephen Walker, Steve Heistand, Thomas Tranecker, and Tom Nathy. Cool, huh? Yes. Because you get a list of all, do you see that list? No, because when I click on it, I get a white box. Mm -hmm. I Guido, you, I do have a low camera angle because I am using my laptop today, um, because I have replaced my computer. But my computer, remember the computer randomly restarted in the middle of a broadcast, and uh, this was the cause. What is that? It's a video card. So sad. That so, is one hell of a video card. It's a Asus 97870, and it's, I believe, garbage. I, I have EPCs smaller than your video card. Yeah, it was, it was nice for a while. It, it mined me a whole Bitcoin. <laughs> um, and uh, so it paid for itself, you know, and then it, maybe mining the Bitcoin killed it. Hmm. Anyway, um, so... So anyway, broken video card, do I buy a new video card or do I buy a whole new computer? Of course I buy a whole new computer. So, so I got a really nice new computer, but it needs to be installed and, up in, and updated and all that. So I got a computer capable of, uh, of playing um, Oculus Rift. Not that I'm getting an Oculus, but I got a computer capable of doing an Oculus. I, so. I'm not going to try and figure out any of that hey you don't you judge me i you i'm not judging worse. you i'm simply trying to figure out yeah no i i have my eyes on some of the widescreen monitors and it's like i'm gonna save and then i'm going to have a monitor that wraps yeah. around the planet yeah. yeah no we just go in different yeah. directions yeah uh my old computer ned de wants to know my old computer was about six years old so time for new for, time for the new hottest yeah um <laughs> Tell me they got, oops, got an error occurred. Aces didn't like Fraser's review of his video card. True that. <laughs> um, yeah, Elite. I have Elite Dangerous. Uh, Thomas Tranicus is Elite with Oculus. Squeal, yes. So the, I bought a computer capable of running Oculus. Now do I buy an Oculus? Kind of have to, don't I? Yeah. David Fairweather says, just want an excuse to update. Yes, duh, obviously. Uh, but no, but having a computer, well, so the plan is that I want to be able to broadcast simultaneous streams on Facebook, Google, YouTube, all the stuff. So that is really the another thing I'm going to try and make this thing do is be a better, more capable multi-streaming machine. So, do you have enough internet in and out of your house? That that's like I can't even imagine that because we just don't have the bandwidth. I have 100 megabits down and about 30 megabits up. Yeah, so it's the ups that would worry me. I think we're at like 15, 20 up, and it's just not enough for multiple oh, streams. Oh, plenty. Plenty. Plenty of up. Um, the only thing that's slow is when I run uh, Google Drive. When Google Drive tries to sync up, it kills 
my whole house's internet connection. What is Fraser's name on Elite? I have no idea. So, like, can you search by my pat my username? My username is FraserKane at gmail.com. So do that. Okay. Um, I use Steam. What is Elite? It's this cool kind of space uh, simulator game. Okay. It's kind of like Wing Commander, but you know, modern. BBLJ says most streamers in gaming have a dedicated streaming box fed by their game box. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. All right. Uh, we should do a show. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I'm, I'm suddenly having this. I have no free time. I am no longer culturally aware because I have no free time. Uh, go see Deadpool. Yeah. No, it. that that's going to happen. I just mm -hmm. need to find someone willing to go with me or suck it up and go by myself. All right. Um, um, oh, I forgot to open Audacity. I should do that. That's what the cool kids do. Yep. Except the cool, and by cool kids, kids get I mean... lagged. <laughs> Thomas Hardman, hello, finally getting to see a live show. Okay, I'm going to try again uh, and say hi to everybody because there's more people now. Okay. Whoa. Hello to Adventure Prime Fire, uh, BVLJ, David Fairweather, Elad Avron, Funky Brains, Gudo Bibra, James Haney, John Marson, Christoph Wurbrisky, I'm so sorry, Career the Vegan, M. Dennison, Michael Mayer, Mike Cohen, Nancy Graziano, Robert, Scott, Herrick, Sylvan Westby, Steve Heiston, Thomas Artman, Thomas Traniker, Tom Nathy, Tony Lynch, and William Vanderbeek. And, and so I cool. feel the need to point out that Funky Brains, it's B-R-A-N-E-S, as in the like string theory brain, not yeah. as in like what's in your skull, which it's somehow even cooler because of and how a, it's spelled. And a big thanks uh, to... Um, Paul Matt Sutter for uh, collaborating with me on a, on my latest YouTube video. It was super fun. We we answered the uh, you've answered this one in the past, which is like is what's the difference between a black hole and the singularity that created the you know universe, the Big Bang singularity, you know. And your answer is that you know black hole is embedded in space time, while the singularity contains space, space time as well. Time. Yeah, and uh, that was awesome. So. Uh, so we did a two part episode. We answered the first part, which was that one, which is like, what's the difference? And then the second part is, you know, if you run the math and you take the mass of the universe and you find out how big a black hole you would get, you get a black hole with the density of the universe and, the, and an event horizon the size of the universe, <clears throat> which is a coincidence, turns out. But uh, Pamela, or sorry, but, uh, but Paul answered that as well. So um, it was really fun to do a collaboration on YouTube. And so I think there'll be one with you and me and maybe we'll yeah. find some other people and do more collaborations. So that'd be great. I guess I uh, should do a show. Probably. Call the Astronomy Cast. Yeah. And just to warn everyone now, I'm going to be looking kind of all over the place because this was one that I needed to acquire notes for. And my notes are in like 12 different windows. All right. Also, you're easily distracted. Squirrel. Well, yeah. Okay. Say one. Okay. I am pressing the record button. It is recording. Except I have also the pressed wrong... the record button. No, it's doing it right. Okay. Hi, Preston. Hey, Preston. Um, you thank ready? you for fixing our feed. And all of you, thank you for your patience while our feed was slightly broken. Thank you for telling us when things were broken because we have no idea. Uh, there's too many ways. It's a very fragile yeah. machine and it can break in about a thousand different ways. So if you're not experiencing the astronomy cast awesomeness that you've come to expect, please let us know. And somewhere we will fix one of the tubes. Uh, you ready? I, I think so. Okay, here we go. Astronomy cast episode 403 funding big science from Alma to LIGO to TMT. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of the Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Awesome. Uh, super excited about the gravitational waves announcement. We, of course, uh, predicted this years ago in Astronomy <laughs> Cast, but, but it's nice to see uh, modern science catching up with uh, with the stuff that we've explained for our for our listeners uh, over but, the last but couple. But you weeks. know, it still wasn't a six sigma detection. They have spent billions, well, at least many, many millions, and and they have like one low signal. To There'll noise. be more. There'll be more. <laughs> There, there's worry. no way to predict that. That's the thing. But I anyways, just predicted I'm it. Being, I'm being a curmudgeon. You I are being this. a curmudgeon. Yeah. So 
But on this, big science takes big money and observatories make some of the biggest science there is. So how do projects like this get conceived and funded and where does the money come from? Uh, so, you know, we've, we've been doing this show long enough and you've been involved in this long enough that you've actually gone through whole cycles. You've been involved in helping pick uh, big concepts, helping suggest missions. So uh, this is really exciting. You, you've been a, you know, <laughs> you've been a part of this whole cycle, which is great. Yeah. Um, so I'm starting to feel old. <laughs> <laughs> like like one of the elder states people of this whole uh, situation. It's weird. Um, so let's let's go back. So let's talk about like a big mission, like like the thirty meter telescope, which is one of the ones, or the absurdly overwhelmingly large observatory. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, in the end, here's this great big telescope perched atop a, a volcanic Hawaiian island. How did it get from concept through funding? to to an actual construction well well so the the tmt uh is actually currently canceled but it's yeah budget is sitting there right um well, and let's imagine <laughs> you know in sits on the canary Island, whatever right a big telescope first so, top yeah. of hawaiian volcanic island so so i think the the key thing is you brought up this is a long process and our funding for these massive facilities comes from two different places. It comes from the National Science Foundation and it comes from NASA here in the United States. And globally, we're looking at beyond the United States, the funding comes from government agencies and from universities and other nations. Yeah, we have the National Research Council here in Canada. And, and so when we're looking to build these giant facilities like the Canada, France, Hawaii telescope, which is oddly located in Arizona. Um, in the, in these cases, you're looking to build, uh, actually, no, I'm sorry, I lied. That one is located in Hawaii. It's mm -hmm. Wynn, which is in, uh, in Arizona. When you're Hawaii looking- Hawaii though is, is, our, is our next province. Right. So, so you have the, the Kenna Hawaii France telescope in Hawaii. You have Wynn, which is, uh, I believe, Wyoming, Yale, something that begins with an I, National uh, Optical Astronomy Observatory. These are consortium telescopes. And as we build bigger and bigger and bigger facilities, uh, they stop being four letter acronyms and they become groups of 30, 40, 50 different institutions and nations, each adding in their own chunk to the pie. Uh, okay, so, but I mean, th that's two different creatures, right? There's the one of just having like a single country, like, you know, the United States choosing a telescope, funding it and getting it built. And then you consortium is like a whole other level of complexity. You just, you just, you know, added orders of magnitude to the complexity. Can we go back and just figure out how the, <laughs> how the, the single country version of this gets done? Well, the single country one is getting more and more rare. So in either case, the, the starting point is um, you have a national vision for where science is going. And you start with that vision. Here in the United States, we call it the decadal survey. More and more nations are starting to come up with their own version of the decadal survey. And these are where you get key players in the scientific field of your respective nation and make them write reports and white papers and more reports and more white papers until you end up with a massive document that details what they see as the most important science questions to be answered in the next 10 years and detail what are the spacecraft, what are the ground-based facilities that are needed to answer those questions. So for instance- And you were actually involved, sorry, you were involved yeah. in the decadal survey. So how did that happen? Like, did you get the call? <laughs> That's actually how it happens. Right, so, so someone uh, called you and said, Pamela, we need your help. Pretty much. At, at the highest levels, the National Research Council or National Academies of Science uh, in the United States will enjoin panels. And they start at the highest levels. And these are the key players who then are like, OK, so we need um, no one person is an expert in everything. And we admit to that most of the time. And, and so 
that top panel will be like, and we need to enjoin people to discuss star formation, people to discuss gravitational lensing, people to discuss extragalactic astronomy and star formation. And so you get all of these different panels together. Some of them are discussing ideas like increasing diversity, increasing education. Others are trying to figure out what are the facilities that we need to move forward. And so you end up with this tiered of panels reporting to larger committees, reporting to a core committee at the top that edits together a massive document that then goes to the National Science Foundation and to NASA and is used to set up funding goals. And this is where you start seeing looking at how the National Science Foundation breaks apart the funding that they get from Congress and says, OK, so now we're going to spend this much on extragalactic, this much on facilities, this much on planetary science. And that breakup reflects what's needed to meet these decadal survey goals. Okay. So, you know, again, you got the call, uh, you <laughs> join the panel, you guys make a bunch of, of recommendations. Those recommendations then become, uh, they go to to which to the funding agencies to the national science foundation and such is yep. that right yes okay so, so let's imagine let's say that you know uh someone says we would like to understand dark matter better and so someone says we should make the dark matter observatory yeah that yeah, actually I happened think, that's pretty much okay. how it occurred so okay so in this case dark energy was uh detailed as one of the most important problems we can try and solve and so funding was set aside to go for the w first instrument and for the uh, dark energy explorer the het decks on the hobby eberly telescope uh and so we have, first of all, a many million dollar instrument being built to go on a nine meter telescope down in Texas, and then an entire spacecraft that is working its way slowly towards construction and launch. Okay, so somebody, a panel, a group at the National Science Foundation sets we'll aside this budget. For proposals, yeah. We'll put out a call for proposals. So, but who has a, approved the budget? Is it the you know, the executive of the National Science Foundation, or is it the government? Who who decides it's, how much money is going to be spent? Actually, at a certain level, uh, is a mix of Congress and bureaucrats. So, so you have the president's budget will say, and we wish to give this much to the NSF and this much to NASA, and there's a certain amount of more detailed goals. For instance, James Webb Space Telescope is a line item request. And with all of these budgets put in, um there is large chunks that are set aside like this amount will go towards facilities and then it's in the hands of the folks at the national science foundation working through a competitive process to try and figure out so of all of this facilities money that isn't line item allocations how much of it goes towards keeping things like the arecibo radio telescope going how much of it goes towards keeping the vla going and there are competitive processes where they say okay let's compete to uh, to run these different organizations and hey anyone who has a good idea can compete now you may not necessarily win if you don't have the staffing and the support and the institution to support you but it's a competitive process where they come in and say, we can do it for this amount of money. We're getting this amount, amount of additional funding from our university, from our institution, from partnerships with other institutions. And over time, you'll actually see some facilities amount of funding change in terms of what's paid for by the National Science Foundation versus what's paid for out of individual university uh, funding. Right. So I can kind of imagine that, you know, the decadal survey comes together, the recommendation is to build a dark energy, detect some kind of mission. Yeah. So then the National Science Foundation or NASA goes out and says, hey, everybody, you know, give us proposals for a mission that will help understand dark energy better. And then people will come back and say, we could do it for 100 million. We could do it for 500 million. If you gave us 5 billion, we could come up with a really <laughs> cool spacecraft. 
They right? usually do cap it. They cap the okay. So they say like, but don't spend more than three hundred million dollars. Right. Like, go crazy, but not that crazy. Exactly. We're not going to listen. Okay, great. So then all the proposals come in, and they pick one of the proposals, and then it's they turn around. More. Yeah. There are more proposals, and they turn around and say, okay. We like this idea of this three hundred million dollar mission. Start building it, or like, like, mm -hmm. give us another proposal, or do they want to turn around and take that idea and farm that out to a bunch of people and say, okay, we now know what the what that mission is going to be. We want these, you know, all of you ten people to propose to build this this mission, or it's the person who's proposed the mission, the one who's then going to build it. It it can go both ways, okay. or all of the above, actually. So, okay, for great. instance. If you have something that already exists that's been around for a while, they will recompete management of it on a six to ten year basis, depending on what the facility is. So the people who are running the very large array today, who are in fact running the National Radio Astronomy Observatory today, those may not be the same people. Those may not be the same organizations. So they will recompete the entire organization on a regular basis. Right. Now, at a lower yeah. level, they will also say, okay, so we really like your idea for this big picture instrument and say NASA is the person funding the, t the spacecraft because NASA funds spacecraft. Uh, now we're going to compete out all the instruments on that spacecraft. So they fund one body to be the main cooperative agreement or grant holder, depending on the size of the spacecraft. And now they're going to compete out the instruments. So this can go down to a very fine level of, we like your idea, but, or, hey, it's a small project, go for it. We trust you to do it on your own. It all depends on how much money is involved, how much they're going to micromanage you, and how much they're likely to recompete your idea along the way, potentially even removing you from your own idea. Well, that's it. And that's that's got to be heartbreaking, right? Is that you propose a really clever idea for some cool coronagraph that nobody's thought of. And it's intriguing of an enough of an idea that you really need to put it back out to 10 different people to see who can build you a coronagraph for the amount of money that you can afford who has the you know the person who comes up with the idea isn't necessarily the team that's best equipped to actually build the final project so i can imagine that's a little uh, a little frustrating so okay so we've got the situation you've, you've we've got the the they've gone over proposals the proposals come back one of the proposals is chosen for say 300 million dollars how does the funding then flow to the people who are going to build this thing? It, it's usually through a cooperative, cooperative agreement process. And it's not going to be $300 million. The entire budget for facilities for the National Science Foundation is like $150 million to fund everything. Well, I was thinking like a new telescope, like the 30 meter telescope, right? That's going to cost big money to build. Right, but they're not going to fund all of it up front. And it's still not going to cost that much money. The, a lot of people don't really understand the, the full range in, in cost for these different uh, facilities. So we, we're used to dealing with numbers like the Hubble Space Telescope, 2.5 billion. But when we start looking at ground-based facilities, our most cutting edge, crazy facilities where we had to build the road there. Things like that, we're looking at the Atacama um, Telescope, ALMA, the radio array down in South America. That is as hard a project as you get. Um, that was 1.4 billion. When you look at the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, its entire cost for the National Science Foundation part is 466 million. So it's a much less expensive project. And that's spread out over a couple of decades where the most expensive year that it has slated, they're looking at 100 million. And that year, it pretty much eats all the facilities budget for everybody by itself. All of right. It. So, but the point being that, that they are feeding that money in tranches over 
very long periods of time. Yes. And, and this is how if, we can do these projects. Right. And if you fail to deliver on your milestones, somebody else can be selected to take over and finish the project. Or they just can it. There is a right. history of that happening. We were working in Texas, and by we, I mean people much older than me, because I was still in college. Uh, there was a large synchrotron cyclotron uh, that was being built under Texas. Uh, superconducting super collider. Yeah. And um, it, Congress didn't like it. It was going over budget. It was behind schedule. And they didn't like it. And so they canceled the project. And it probably actually cost them more money to close out the project than it would have for them to let it just keep going. Right. Uh, okay, so now I will uh, permit the more complicated version of this story, which <laughs> is the international collaboration side. So like you just discussed, that's how it works. If it's just an American only or just a Canadian, you know, it's only our um, uh, National Research Council. Uh, so what if it's going to be an international collaboration? How does that come together? And how, do the, how does the money flow? So, so there you end up usually working with a central, central organization that gets formed to run the facility. And it may be running through a single uh, university that has to put together all of these partnerships and that central university is the one that maintains the risk. You put together in some cases full international treaties on and Germany shall provide this much money and Italy shall provide this much money. And in exchange for providing that much money, they get a certain share of the scientific time on the instruments. So you're looking at a certain number of nights where they get as particular as this institution will get this many dark nights and this many gray nights and this much bright time. And it's very particular so that you know exactly what you're getting for your dollars. And sometimes it's not a specific, and we're going to contribute this much money. It's going to be instead, and we're going to contribute this instrument. And in that case, the institution that's supplying the instrument is taking on, in some ways, even a greater risk because it could be that that instrument ends up costing them more than they thought. Um, so it's a very detailed set of contracts that go into place and you can end up in real trouble sometimes. The Gemini telescope ran into issues a few years ago where the United Kingdom was like, and we're no longer going to be supporting this. So suddenly you had a national government saying, we're out, no more money for you. And Gemini still had to figure out how to pay its bills. And the U.S. is actually kind of notorious for doing this to international collaborations to build spaceships, where we're like, and we're no longer going to be helping you build your spaceship, or, and we're going to do a new by ourselves. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, this happens. We're kind of mm -hmm. bastards. Oh. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, so I can imagine right, the complexities of this, like on the one hand, if you have something really simple, like it's just a telescope and we're all going to collaborate our money, some agency is the lead, right? And then it could be government or it could be a university, it could be a research institution, and then they sign on partners, I guess you do horse trading to say, we need another $30 million, we'll give you one seventh of our observing time in exchange for your $30 million, you can have, you know, it's like the way I help my children negotiate. You can have every, you know, every second Wednesday, um, uh, you can use the observatory. Or they can say, we need a specific instrument, a very special kind of camera. And you Italians are really, you know, have a lot of experience in making these kinds of cameras. So would you be willing to contribute that special camera to this telescope? And in exchange, you can use the telescope or your institutions can use it on, on these nights, those nights, whatever. So, so like on the one hand, it really, it allows observatories to be built that just could never be built by any right. one country, one research institution, whatever, but it generates a level of complexity and uh, international trade law and et cetera. That's just gotta be, you know, the bureaucracy has just gotta be overwhelming. Well, it's the bureaucracy in the grand scheme of things, the the Pacific trade agreements, the, those are much more complicated. The real problem is the, the fact that once an instrument's going, once a facility is going, it 
really is possible for random partner to drop out and to essentially kill the entire project and everyone loses all of their money that has already been spent. And so this and is where you can get a are, lot of animosity. Right. And these exist, right? There are yeah. half built instruments out there that the funding just ran out and people pulled out and the thing just never got built. Yeah. And in trying to look at all of this, the scientists are kind of caught in the middle because on one hand, we desperately want to see all of our facilities kept in place. But as the horse trading goes on, we end up seeing things like right now, uh, Arecibo is yet again at risk. And it, it seems like Congress and NSF and NRAO have been systematically trying to get rid of Arecibo every year or two, as long as I've been an adult. Um, it's just one of those yeah. facilities they keep trying to kill. And it's the coolest facility. Well, it's it's one of the cool ones, and it's doing solid science. It's just not doing the sexy stuff that completely um, grabs every single headline. It's doing the really necessary stuff, and unfortunately, but isn't it the observatory that made contact with aliens? Or maybe I'm thinking of a book. Yeah, I think that's kind of a movie, but okay, yeah. A movie. But it is the observatory that keeps imaging asteroids as they come tumbling past and helping us to accurately measure their distances. Being able to accurately measure the distance to an asteroid kind of helps us know if we're going to die or not. And I'm in a favor. I'm in favor of knowing if we're going to die. Right. Uh, so, do you think, though? I mean, with a lot of the low hanging fruit has been plucked. The you know, you know the easier discoveries. The Uranus. We discover we have, you know, we've discovered a bunch of moons of 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 Saturn. We've been able to see some Kuiper Belt objects. That we're moving into this future where the bigger and bigger science is going to require much bigger, much more expensive instruments. Things like the the thirty meter telescope, the was it the overwhelmingly large telescope, the uh, you know, extraordinarily the, large telescope, extraordinarily yeah. large ever comes after the large hadron collider that 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 these international collaborations of big science are going to be the rule then that's the only way that you're going to be able to keep pushing boundaries out is with ever more larger observatories i mean you could build an observatory or the 30 meter telescope will kick hubble's butt when it finally gets built from the ground, right? It'll kick its butt all the way from the ground up into orbit. Which is but why we're not replacing else. Hubble. Right, um, right. But, 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 you know, you need these. So do you see this being just, like, this is the rule, that, that we better buckle down and get better at international uh, science law? And I, I see it as actually a problem. So right now we have this trend where in order to answer the cutting edge, we haven't got a clue kind of problems. We need to build these many, many, many billion dollar facilities. And as we build more and more of these built billion dollar facilities, they eat up more and more of the overall facilities maintenance budget. Um, LIGO, which I'm a curmudgeon about, costs $30 million a year to maintain out of a budget that's 100 to 120 million a year from the National Science Foundation. So you're looking at one facility that has been running since the mid 90s and has made a single detection in that entire time that wasn't even a Six Sigma detection. Um, I am a curmudgeon, I admit totally. to this. Yeah. But it's eating a huge, huge portion of the budget in hopes of making detections that confirm theories. It's not even trying to push our understanding into new directions. It's trying to say, yes, our understanding is correct. Um, as we build more and more of these single purpose, single science facilities, 
we are losing our ability to find out what we don't know, which is a really weird thing to say. But if you think about it, LIGO is my pet peeve because I just I look at its entire budget and I'm like, why didn't we kill this and build Lisa and just have higher quality in orbit? Personal problem. I admit to this. I'm a curmudgeon about LIGO. But get over it already. Come no. On. Work um, through it. <laughs> so, so, so talk to your therapist. So we have Planck and we have WMAP, which have done outstanding things that have changed our understanding of the expansion of the universe. But at the end of the day, these were instruments that were built to study a single thing, the cosmic microwave background. They did have some ancillary science they could do, but it was limited ancillary science. With the Large Hadron Collider, we have something that was designed to look for the Higgs boson. That's where the majority of its budget has ended up going. It is going to potentially do ancillary additional science looking for additional particles, but we're spending huge proportions of our budget on these facilities that can do a thing. Now, right. luckily we do have other things out there like the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope that has a primary purpose of making sure we don't die by asteroid, but in the process of doing that primary purpose is going to do probably more uh, discovery of things we don't even know exist than like everything else out there. Yeah, we, the, we talked to a guest on the Weekly Space Hangout that it's going to potentially find thousands of supernovae each pass. Now, we have a problem with this, though. In, in putting such a huge proportion of our budget into these single-purpose instruments, LSST is a survey instrument, um, we don't have any telescopes left to follow up on what they discover. There, there's a few out there, but universities are closing them up in favor of these giant systems. If we don't have those four meter telescopes out there to follow up on what LSST discovers, how the heck do we turn these discoveries into real understanding? Well, that sounds like it's a sort of a bat that will never be complete, right? That, that you'll be like, you'll get ahead on the one place you'd be like oh we've got too many single purpose instruments that are churning out too much data and we don't have, we can't do follow up observations so then the next round of funding will encourage a bunch of the more general purpose instruments and then you'd be like yeah but we've got these specific questions we really need answers and it'll just go back and forth see there's there's a problem with that logic versus reality and the problem is reality is we're in a flat budget scenario if you're in a flat budget scenario Every time you build a new instrument, you have to kill an old one. So this means that we don't get to keep the general purpose telescopes that allow us to follow up on what the single purpose ones find if we build the single purpose ones. And as we're building more and more of these hyper expensive facilities, the Almas of the world, these hyper expensive facilities, they wipe out a large number of the small facilities. One of the most terrifying things I saw is all of Kitt Peak National Observatory is currently somewhat in jeopardy, all of it. This is one of the great observatories in North America. And we may have to shut it down because we have too many other things like LSST that we're okay, trying fine. to figure out You're how to charge. pay for. <laughs> you, you're in charge. I hereby elect you queen of funding, uh, and you can magically disappear any projects that you don't like, uh, and every project will come in on budget, on time. <laughs> what would you do? I, I have to admit that I would want things that were highly productive. Um, LSST fits that model of highly productive science. Yeah, don't so you take that away from me. Right. So things that are out there and the data per dollar is high. I am in favor of using that as something of a criteria. And this is what makes me so curmudgeonly about LIGO is you don't have a lot of data per dollar. Um, I think that when it comes to projects that are low data per dollar, we need to spread out that budget so far that no one nation is really suffering under the weight of it. When we look at things like LIGO, those are international collaborations, but that is 30 million a year that we're looking at in 
the numbers I found, and I admit I didn't reconfirm them on the NSF uh, website because the NSF website left me scratching my head. But the number I was finding was thirty million a year to maintain it, and um, that's that's huge. That that can go into so much other science. All right. Well, on that note, thank you so much, Pamela. Thank you. Um, okay. Stop the recording. I will save this later. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. All kinds of good questions. Uh, <clears throat> Steve Chisel says, one thing I would like to see done is preserve the Yerkes Observatory. That is uh, up outside of Chicago. It's actually... Um, I th think it's, it is part of a park. It has a visitor center, but it's no longer being used for science. And at one point, and I didn't follow up with this, at one point they were looking to turn the, the grounds that it's on, the parks that it's on, into a spa resort. And I just like the idea that you have the spa resort and observatory uh, yeah. deeply amuses me. That needs totally. to be a thing. I don't think yeah, it became absolutely. a thing, but it needs to be a thing. Needs to be a thing. Um, Ashwin Raghavaraman asks, how much of a difference do you think crowdfunding projects like Penny for NASA will make in funding projects that ran out of budget? I, I don't mm, think zero. it will work. For, yeah. I mean, it will yeah. help for the individual. CosmoQuest exists from crowdfunding. Yeah. But it's, it's not going to be sufficient to have a long-term maintenance budget. So we look at things like the Allen Telescope Array that in large part was crowdfunded um, by SETI. That was how they saved the array's funding. Yeah. Um, they still have to figure out how to come up with the maintenance costs for that. And you can't easily crowdfund maintenance costs year after year after year for more than two or three staff people. Um, mm -hmm. It's There's just people want stuff in exchange for their crowdfunding and when you crowdfund NPR through the donation drives you you get that daily audio on your way home um, when you crowdfund the Van Allen telescope you might get one or two really cool news stories a year and a regular strain of uh, just science is science that isn't necessarily sexy to people who aren't in that specific subfield. It was Paul Allen, right? The, uh, mm -hmm. the half of Microsoft who helped yeah. fund that. Thanks, Paul. Um, ooh. Uh, who in the 20s, this comes from David Joseph Wesley, who in the 2016 US election is most probable to be science friendly? Uh, none of the Republicans. Mm -hmm. um, I, I actually, one of the things that a lot of people are complaining about is we haven't heard a lot out of Sanders and Clinton on uh, exactly how they would fund science. But aren't the Republicans generally a lot more, um, like they've been contributing or they've been pushing a lot of uh, of NASA funding, like if, like in the last few budgets, NASA's actually done pretty well under so, Republican. So the issue is the difference between pre-Reagan fiscal conservative Republicans, most of whom are fairly sane individuals that I'm okay with. Mm -hmm. And then there's the Tea Party. And, right. and the problem is that when you're dealing with a lot of people who don't want data that supports climate change, they don't want data that supports evolution, they don't want data that supports cosmology, why are they going to be funding astronomy? And some of these people are actually very anti-science funding. Um, Ted Cruz is someone who's anti-science funding in a lot of cases. So you can see him being deadly to a lot of the budgets. Uh, Trump, I think, is uh, someone who would take uh, one of the congressional ideas is all National Science Foundation projects must uh, have a demonstrable benefit to the American people. And right, which astronomy, is basic science. Yeah, astronomy doesn't generally have a predetermined 
benefit to the American people. Now, Wi-Fi exists because of Australian radio astronomers, but we didn't know that going into funding their project. It was it was a spinoff that came up and was awesome. Um, I don't know if enough about Rubio to say anything. Clinton and Sanders in general um, are, are pro-intelligence, pro-academia. Um, but Well, maybe we'll talk about this again as the election gets closer and there's less contenders and we got a better sense of what their platforms are right now because mostly you know they're not really going into that level of detail about their, their funding that might be interesting of course to me of course as a canadian your political system is a mystery to me i'm just a simple canadian <laughs> and um you know your your house of representatives and house of congress and so on it's all just yeah. gibberish what you know where is your allegiance to the queen um, hey, so, look, if I hadn't gotten this NASA grant, we were moving to Canada. We were moving to Canada, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I am one is... NASA grant away from moving to Canada. <laughs> Come on up. The water's cold. Um, okay, well, let's move on. Let's get another question here. Um, uh, ooh, Blair Pigeon asks, uh, with limited funding available, can we do more better research of our solar system using only robots instead of humans? Yes, on yes, we can. Except yeah. the, the thing to, to take note of is the overall NASA budget is largely predetermined what goes towards the exploration division, what goes towards the science mission directorate, what goes towards each of the different directorates within NASA. So if the budget coming down to NASA says, and we're going to spend this much on human spaceflight, we're going to spend that much on human spaceflight. So it's not like we can magically say in the decadal survey, we don't think we should spend any more money on humans in space. Now, humans are great construction people. They are great fix-its. Having human beings able to go up and build things and fix things is awesome. Now, we're not doing that as much as we could. We're not leveraging that ability as well as we could at this moment in time. Um, we don't have a launch vehicle that let, lets us. But, um, yeah, no, we could do a whole lot better exploration if more of the budget was leveraged towards robotic exploration instead of um, a publicly funded attempt to go to Mars. Right. Uh, I went off on uh, the Weekly Space Hangout on Friday and did this big analogy about pancakes and, and space exploration. So uh, if you want to see my opinion on that, go ahead and, uh, and watch Friday's episode. I think I was entertaining and made for a very hungry audience. They were all, <laughs> they were all thinking pancakes would have been really nice at that time. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, um, I totally disagree with you. Um, okay, let's move on. <laughs> Um, do you think NASA should stop funding SLS? It comes from Michael Meyer, our good friend, Michael Meyer. Uh, do you think NASA should stop funding SLS and help SpaceX send people to Mars? I think that's above my pay grade and, uh, total disclosure on this. I am speaking as me. This is volunteer time. This has nothing to do with my NASA funding. This is outside of the work I do that is funded by NASA. I am not speaking as NASA in any way. All the disclosures. I am speaking as Pamela Gay from my own home office. Mm -hmm. um, so so I'm, I'm not convinced that SLS is going to be as cost effective as investing in supporting Elon Musk's efforts. That said, there are a lot of powerhouses behind SLS, and I wonder what would happen if we challenged them to be as cost effective as Elon Musk has to be. Um, and if they weren't saddled by all of the internal bureaucracy, SpaceX is a single company, SLS is a consortium, that's going to drive up the costs in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, I, I just can't see any way that NASA isn't going to be buying rockets from SpaceX. They That's already just, are. Like all, all of them. All of them. <laughs> I can all see the them rockets. working. I, there's Blue Origins and Boeing. Is doing, Blue Origins is doing good work. Sierra Nevada is doing good work. SLS is a confusing project that I am confused about the future for. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, okay. Let's see. I did, I did set off the audience again in some kind of hunger based frenzy for pancakes. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, that was a great question. Mm. Throw any questions you got. Apologies. I have to, it's not as easy. Uh, Steve Chisel says, when are the Weekly Space Hangouts and where are they held? What website? They are on Fridays at noon Pacific and they are held on my universe, on my YouTube channel. We also tweet them. We also post them in uh, on Universe Today when the show goes live. But if you look for my name on YouTube, you'll find my channel. It's the one that's got 70,000 followers. Subscribe to that. Asked to be announced when we do live events, and then you'll see that one. So, yeah. Um, so, Nancy Graziano asks as a follow up, um, let's see. Okay, so Thomas Hartman asks, sorry, I was going to try and find Nancy's earlier question first. So, Thomas Hartman asks, what are the alternatives to LIGO? Um, Lisa, the spacecraft that has been, uh, I had the most fabulous tweet the day of the, the announcement, which I think was Thursday. Um, someone tweeted to me, did Lisa detect it as well? And I was like, wah, Lisa wah. hasn't been built yet. And, and they responded, but, but yes. I remember you talking about it in the first year of Astronomy Cast. I assumed it would be built by now. Well, so did I. So did I. Yes. Um, so, so my... It's my, up there in our dreams with the terrestrial... Yeah. Planet. My curmudgeonly grumpiness is if instead of building this whole network of ground-based things, we just built something that didn't have the noise issues because they were in orbit. Um, it, yeah. Here's why I'm excited about gravitational waves as a method of astronomy. And I agree with you that LISA is the way to go. Let's take LIGO, mothball it, launch it into space, whatever. Um, is that gravi gravitational waves theoretically allows us to perceive things that we can't see with any other method. It is an entirely new way of seeing. So an entirely new way of seeing deserves a little love. And so I think that Lisa, something like Lisa that would actually let you, you know, like if you could actually see the gravitational waves, how they come together, you could get a sense of what's going on inside the event horizon as those black holes are coming together. You could, you know, get a much better shot at, at detecting some of these primordial gravitational waves, maybe some, some proof of inflation. Maybe you're going to see other things closer don't to home. Have the ability to do that right now. I'm right, but 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 that's how this works, right? Is yeah. you, step one is you like you even just find it in the first place. Step two is you fine tune your methods and and come up with a better system for studying and analyzing them. You know, we did this with with uh, gravitational lensing. You know, step one, you're like, wait a minute, that galaxy's all wibbly wobbly. And then later on, you're like, and now we've detected concentrations of dark matter to six sigma, thanks I, to, you I, know what I mean? A better analogy is neutrinos. Uh, sure. We've been desperately trying to detect neutrinos for a long time. A great deal of cleaning fluid has been buried in old mines all over the world uh, to detract, detect neutrinos. We've done entire episodes on this. And it's taken a long time to figure out how to detect all the different flavors to be able to figure out this burst of neutrinos that we just detected here was due to this supernova explosion over there. Now, the thing about the neutrino detectors is they, they are working. They're producing result after result after result. The thing that is making me so curmudgeonly about LIGO is we thought there were going to be a bunch of detections per year and the press conference was like we detected one with less than six sigma results and now we're going to spend all this money to build all these new detectors to increase our signal and this is like the nth time they've done this this was something that they said they could do in 98 and they've just lost my faith mm, except they found one and now they're going to get better at it. So um, you and I totally disagree. But yeah. that's cool. 
Um, uh, so uh, first, um, where was it? Oh, G Man three fifty one says humans need a moon based telescope next, and then Steve Chisel says a thousand times yes. A radio dish on the moon, array with one on Earth, effectively a bigger dish than Earth itself. So there you go. There's your reason. Go back to the moon. Put a radio <laughs> dish on the far side of the moon. Awesome. Um, so Nancy's original question, uh, do you think that keeping existing facilities doing good science, operating their full potential, is more important than bringing newer, sexier facilities online? So should we, should we maintain the old facilities or should we build the new facilities? I think that it needs to be a mix. Um, some of the facilities that are already up and running and doing awesome science, uh, they they aren't replaced by something that's better. So, so for instance, we're in the process of building a new, better, greater solar observatory on the top of Haleakala in Hawaii. When it's done, it will deprecate what can be done by the Mayall Telescope in Arizona. So at least I think that's the right name, the Big Arizona Solar Telescope at Kitt Peak. Um, I may have the wrong name attached to it. Um, that telescope is getting closed because it's getting deprecated. Now at the same time, there's a bunch of four meter class telescopes out there that are doing consistently solid science that are owners of a certain brightness regime in the sky. The super big telescopes can't observe really bright things, just blasts their electronics. We need to have a certain number of one meter, four meter, eight meter telescopes that are able to fully observe the range and brightness of things that happen in the sky. And a four meter telescope doesn't get rid of the need to have a one meter telescope. It just gets rid of the need to have hundreds of one meter telescopes. Um, so we need to be strategic in what we get rid of. Arecibo has very specific uses that it's really good at. At the same time, Green Bank, it, it was kind of duplicated by other things. So get rid of the things that are duplicated, keep the things that aren't duplicated and are still workhorses. Well, but I mean, even like, say you're gonna do some research and you're gonna observe a bunch of variable stars. Mm -hmm. In your perfect world, you get access to the Hubble Space Telescope and you do the most sensitive observations that you could. But because there's a lineup, you have to use, I don't know, the stupid McDonald's Observatory or something, you know, awesome like that. So you're still getting some science done. And so yeah. you're still kind of pushing the whole thing forward. It's just that, um, uh, you know, that, that you're... And then you might have to come back around and now you've, you're going closer to some kind of understanding and then you come back around and you're like, can now can we use Hubble for just five minutes yeah, just to make this one little observation that will confirm everything else that we've, you know, we've determined. So, and this is where we need that full suite of the workhorses that are in constant use and are doing their thing, but they're not doing the most cutting edge thing with the most immediate results, they're doing the long-term, long-duration study work. If you could imagine a workhorse, you know, like I just imagine like a pickup truck of, mm -hmm. of telescopes, what would it be for sort of like best bang for your buck money-wise? What would be sort of like a really good observatory to run? There, there's a bunch of two to four meter telescopes out there that are just, you're slow and steady. They have a good suite of photometers, a good suite of spectrometers, and they're able to do consistent science. Um, it makes sense to, to keep these a few of these, you don't have to keep all of them, but keep a few of these two and four meter class telescopes. The 107 inch at McDonald Observatory is one of these great examples that it keeps reinventing itself as a test bed for new instruments and as some place that's pushing the limits on what can be done from the ground. So could you imagine, you know, just a whole bunch of those get built around the world? Well, the and thing is, we no, already have a bunch of them, so we don't need more, to build any more ones. Don't need any more? Like, it's not line up, even on those two to four meter telescopes? There is, but at a certain point, 
the fact that there's a lineup means that crap science isn't getting done. There's always someone out there saying, hey, I have this idea and it's a bad idea. So it's okay if the time is somewhat oversubscribed. It's when things are five or six times oversubscribed that you have a problem, but these aren't oversubscribed at that level. Right, okay. Uh, why don't we wrap up this episode? So uh, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks, Pamela, for bringing the brain as always. Um, I have no idea what we're going to talk about next week. I don't either. We're still we will talk about it though. Out. We'll yes. figure it out. Um, <laughs> David Joseph Wesley says, is Fraser planning on ho hosting Oculus VR weekly space hangouts with the new supercomputer? No, but I love that idea. <laughs> Actually, what I what I want to do is some let's play stuff. I was thinking about doing some like Kerbal Space Program with Amy Shear title or things like that. So some universe sandbox stuff with Pamela. That'd be fun. Um, okay. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you all uh, next week.